Welcome back to Proxam, everybody. And uh, today we're going to be uh, talking about um, the Iandin Craft World. And um, a lot of you, like probably I did uh, when I started Eldar, looked at the Iandin Craft World and thought that they were pretty cool. Um, really liked the fact that they had Wraith Lords and Wraith Guard back in the day. Uh, back in the day, uh, there were no Wraith Blades, there were no Wraith Knights. But um, I was really attracted to the craft world and um, I thought a lot of their special abilities were really cool. And uh, this has continued on into this edition as well. Um, I really think that the uh, craft world is um, pretty awesome. I think that their craft world traits uh, have some merit, um, you know, and I think that uh, Wraith units are still awesome and uh, could potentially be viable um, in a more themed list. So we're going to kind of go into how to build a Iandin craft world uh, lore friendly list. So um, basically here are the goals of the guide. We're going to overview the craft world specifics and unique rules. Um, we're going to look at what units are effective and what combos are effective um, in the craft world. And we're also going to uh, kind of talk about how to remain lore friendly um, while still being effective and competitive on the tabletop. So this is important because, you know, you know, many of us, you know, when we choose a craft world, we choose it based on their specialized units. And it wouldn't be very much fun to run an Iandin craft world list without a lot of Wraith Guard, Wraith Lords, and um, Spirit Seers, right? So um, we're also going to try to remain as lore friendly as possible um, while still being uh, effective and competitive um, on the actual tabletop. So um, let's go ahead and get into it, and uh, let's go ahead and start by looking at the uh, special craft world traits that um, Iandin gets. So um, Iandin's army bonus is called uh, Stoic Endurance. So basically the first part of this rule gives them a bonus to combat attrition tests. Um, and this, this part of the rule is absolutely garbage. <laughs> um, if you stopped there, you would probably think this is the worst craft world trait um, pretty much ever. And the reason why is because, especially when you're running small units, um, you're probably never going to fail a morale test, especially with Wraith Guard, for one. And for two, um, just getting a plus one, it's almost negligible because the unit size is so small. So it's rarely going to be effective. It's rarely going to save you any models. And to be honest with you, um, I'm pretty sure it's almost impossible to... Well, it may not be exactly impossible, but it's pretty hard to fail... A combat attrition test when you have um you know leadership nine and uh, maybe you're only running a squad of five so not really that effective at all uh but i guess it could kind of be useful if the enemy has some sort of rule that forces you to take a leadership check or something like that um but again i've never really seen that outside of a few gimmicky things that something uh, some armies can do so um not a very good um trait but the second part of the trait is absolutely amazing. So basically, it's a slightly worse version of Armor of Contempt, uh, which Marines just got. It basically um, affects AP1 and AP2 weapons. And essentially, all it does is every time an AP2 or AP1 weapon hits an, um, an allied model in your army, um, a Crawford model, um, you count that armor penetration value as one less. So AP-1 becomes AP-0. AP minus two becomes AP minus one, just like the armor of contempt, except it only works with AP negative one and AP negative two weapons. And this pairs exceptionally with Wraith Guard, um, as well as Wraith Lords. And um, I mean, to be honest with you, Rangers, uh, which I'll talk about later in this video. Um, and, you know, a lot of you may be thinking, well, you know, why does it, uh, you know, it's only for AP minus one and AP minus two weapons. And most of the weapons that are going to be targeting Wraith Guard and stuff are going to be really high AP. So it's not going to, if you know, it's probably not going to affect most of the shots that come for your Wraith Lords and Wraith Guard. And normally you'd be correct because, um, units can split fire and they can fire their high AP weapons at units like Wraith Guard. If you only had a couple units of Wraith Guard or maybe a couple Wraith Lords in your army, and you probably wouldn't get that much of an effect from this ability. But because we're Iandin and because everything in the whole army has this ability, not just one or two units, um, something is going to get the benefit. And especially if you run pretty much all Wraith Guard, 
with your only troop option um, or troop choice being rangers, they're going to have to shoot their AP-1 and AP-2 uh, weapons at you eventually. And chances are they're going to be having to basically just be forced to shoot them at Wraith Guard. And your Wraith Guard and your Wraith Lords are going to get a much reduced, um, you know, they're going to reduce that damage by a lot, by minus one AP. So very effective um, and it's very useful for the entire army in general. And it'll just prevent a lot of damage, pure and simple. Um, guided Wraith Sight is the stratagem for the um, Iandin. And basically what this does is um, it allows you to use the Spirit Mark ability on a unit that's outside of the Aura range. So this is really effective for a list that's heavily um, influenced with um, you know Wraith units and stuff like that. And the reason being is... In competitive games where you have to focus on objectives, um, the sad reality is is you're not going to be able to keep every single unit in your army within aura range of a single Spirit Seer. So sometimes you're going to have a Wraith Lord, you're going to have a unit of Wraith Guard off, way off in the distance fighting over some other objective, um, and you're not going to be able to reach them. Well, this stratagem allows you to still use that Spirit Seer to support that unit regardless of the distance. And what this basically does is this gives you the flexibility of playing the objective game with an army that would normally be terrible at the objective game. So a lot of reasons why Iandin, to be honest with you, isn't very competitive is because it's so slow. Yes, it's very tough, but people can run circles around it. People can easily steal objectives from it and make it very hard for them to win on points. Um, And that is just the sad truth. So um, by being able to spread your forces out a little bit um, and still remain supported by your HQ units, um, this can be really effective at helping you actually play the objective game, compete in that arena so that, um, you know, even though you're a slow army, you can still be supported at a distance, um, even though it just costs one command point. um, In in my mind, it's still a very good um, craft world specific stratagem and next up we have the warlord trait enduring resolve this is an iandin exclusive and this basically gives um the warlord uh the chance on on um when he loses a wound on a five plus that wound is not lost kind of like fortune but for the character himself it's not a bad trait it makes the character a lot tougher especially if it's on a jet bike um i think there probably are better ones but i do like this one because uh, the Iandin Craft World is all about survival. And when you have a Farseer or a Utark who can survive that much longer um, and make it that much harder for your enemy to kill him, um, that's really effective. So I really do um, like this ability for that reason. It's not anything spectacular out of this world. Um, it's definitely not, you know, um, you know, and well, I mean, it's definitely not. Uh, Seer of the Shifting Vector or anything like that, uh, which I actually think is one of the best Warlord traits in the in the Codex. Um, but you know what? It is good, um, and you can always use a command point to put it on um, a character that's not your Warlord if you want them to survive a little bit longer, which in most cases will probably be worth it because, to be honest with you, especially in the late game, um, this trait is not that bad. It's really not. Um, helps keep the Warlord alive and, to fight another day. And, I mean, anything that can deny the enemy that Slay the Warlord secondary objective is worth it. Um, okay, so the Citronome of Iandin is the uh, relic that's specific to the Croft World. And this thing is an absolute beast. Okay, so for one, um, basically you can give it to any Iandin model, by the way, any, any Iandin character. And in your command phase, you can select one Spirit Host unit within nine of the bearer. And until the start of your next command phase, so this is one full battle round, your turn and the enemies, you can add plus one attacks to the characteristics of the models in that unit. And if the unit is a Wraith Guard unit, it gains battle focus. Now, to be honest with you, you're probably never going to use it on Wraith Guard unless it's your last choice, last option. I have to be honest. You're either going to give it to um, Wraith Blades is the primary choice or a Wraith Lord if he wants to get into combat that turn. 
Giving your unit plus one attack can make them absolutely insane damage dealers. And a unit of Wraith Blades can charge into something like a Dread Knight with this ability and a couple of buffs and absolutely murder it. So um, I think this is a fantastic um, relic. Helps Wraith Blades clear through things uh, much quicker, makes them more effective, and situationally, it can also give Wraith Guard battle focus um, if needed. So what are um, the different units that work well with Iandid? We kind of covered a few of them, but um, essentially it boils down to these four things. So Farseers, Warlocks, and Spirit Seers, obviously because of their psyche powers, um, really work well with uh, Wraith units. Um, Wraith units are very tough. Farseers, Warlocks, and Spirit Seers all have buffs, uh, both damage and defensive, to make them even, uh, you know, better in combat and tougher to kill as well. Um, we have Wraith Lords, which have obvious synergy with the Spirit Mark ability, um, as well as the fact that they can support, um, you know, Wraith Guard and stuff like that. We have Wraith Guard and Wraith Blades, of course. Um, some of the best units in the Iandin uh, roster. And then we have, lastly, Rangers, which may seem like a surprise, but we don't just take them because they're compulsory. Um, there is a reason why we take them in Iandin lists, which I'll go into. So first up, we have the Farseers, Spiritseers, and Warlocks. And this is pretty straightforward. Farseers have access to Fortune, Guide, and Doom. Um, especially Fortune is really good because it allows you to make Wraithblade units with Ghost Axe and Force Shield even tougher. So, I mean, just think about it for a second. They're getting minus one AP value on AP minus one and AP minus two weapons. They're getting a five plus ignores wounds. They're getting a four plus invul save. They're getting probably a two plus save as well if they have the Jinx, or not the Jinx, sorry, the Protect power up, or if they're in light cover. So, um, honestly, uh, Farseers are a great pick for this list. I would always recommend taking at least one Farseer with Fortune and probably Doom. Um, with Spirit Seers, the Spirit Mark is fantastic. It adds plus one to Wound, making every Spirit Host unit within the Aura much stronger and has great synergy with the Tears of Visha and Guided Wraith Sight. And uh, just remember that the Tears of Visha is usually a D3 uh, regain of wounds on a wraith unit, but when you're within range of a spirit seer, I believe it's six inches, it's just straight up three. So you can use this on a wraith lord to great effect. Um, if your wraith lord is on its last couple wounds, you can go ahead and uh, give it some more, um, you know, life left. You know, you can give it a little bit, a <laughs> little bit of an extra push there. Um, and lastly, we have warlocks and. Uh, Warlocks are insanely good with Iandin, and you can't afford many of them, but um, I would recommend at least taking um, a couple of um, Warlock Skyrunners or perhaps even um, the Warlock Seer Council on foot. Both are great choices. They have access to the Runes of Battle, which make Wraith Blades a lot tougher and harder hitting, um, and they can support the army in a number of other ways as well and provide some much-needed psychic defense. And next up, we have Wraith Lords. Obviously, Wraith Lords uh, make a great use of the Spirit Mark ability. Plus one to wound with their high strength weapons means that they're typically wounding on threes. Now they're going to be wounding on twos. Very effective. The Tears of Isha stratagem we already talked about a little bit gives them extra wounds um, or allows them to regain wounds, I should say. Um, they suffer less from the AP minus one and two uh, weapons because of their... Um, uh, craft world trait, excuse me. So um, they suffer less damage from, you know, kind of on the lower to middling um, AP. Um, and they also support Wraith Blades and Wraith Guards extremely well because Wraith Blades and Wraith Guard have a notoriously bad time with chaff infantry. So people like to swarm Wraith Guard and Wraith Blades with, you know, crappy cultists or things like that to just keep them busy. Well, Wraith Lords can actually sweep through those units fairly quickly and allow your Wraith Guard and Wraith Blade to get to the targets they actually want to kill. Um, and by the way, especially with the new Chaos coming out, um, a lot of new leaks were, um, you know, kind of or reveals, I guess, about the new Chaos. They're going to have a lot of new units. And I think actually, believe it or not, my prediction is cultists are going to be pretty insane. Um, and people are going to field a lot of them. So having Wraith Lords to be able to sweep them away with flamers and scatter lasers uh, might be very effective. 
going up against the new chaos. Now, now we get to the meat and potatoes of Iandin, which are the Wraith Blades and the Wraith Guard. So obviously these synergize very well, um, almost the best with the reducing the AP of negative one and negative two weapons. Um, and this works really well against these guys because most anti-infantry weapons in Iandin base lists are going to be pointed towards these guys, these units, Wraith Guard and Wraith Blades. Um, and they pretty much negate um, at least one AP from these. Um, and they also really work well with the buffs like Fortune and Protect. Uh, it just makes the units very tough to remove and makes them fantastic at holding down objectives, holding down areas of the board that your opponent can't get to. And to be honest with you, I've had a unit of Wraith Blades sit on an objective for the entire game and never get moved off of it. They're that tough under the right circumstance. And then, of course, in addition, Spirit Mark is also very effective on both variants, um, but more so on Wraith Blades just because of the fact that Wraith Blades um, wound on threes and Spirit Mark will allow them to wound on twos. Um, whereas with Wraith Guard, they're already wounding on twos anyway. So um, typically the only way that Spirit Mark's useful on them is if they're going after something like a big creature or big vehicle or something like that. Makes it a little bit easier uh, to wound those targets. Now, lastly, we have Rangers. So I told you guys that we were taking Rangers for a reason other than just being compulsory troop choice. We're also taking them because they obviously give the army objective coverage, but they're actually really good. Um, at surviving in Iandin lists. And here's why. They really benefit from the uh, re reduction of AP minus one and AP minus two weapons. Because if Rangers are in light cover, they're getting plus two to their armor save. So they're getting a three plus in cover. Now, most anti infantry weapons will be minus AP one, which will bring them to a four up, but they'll essentially ignore that. So a lot of the AP minus one anti-infantry weapons that would normally want to shoot at rangers, um, rangers are going to be getting a three plus save against those weapons. And in most cases, especially if you take the gloom field, which even though it's not necessary, um, it does make them a little tougher. It gives the enemy minus one to hit when they're outside of 18 inches. And trust me, if they're within 18 inches of you, your wraith guard are going to have a really fun time dealing with them next turn. Your Wraith Guard and your Wraith Blades are going to go to town on whatever decided to mess with the Rangers. So Rangers are actually very good, and they help you play the objective game really well, and they can help you score on secondaries um, so that your Wraith unit can focus more on dealing damage and um, you know taking objectives away from enemy units. So Rangers are a very good troop choice. Honestly, I think that you know even though they are the cheapest choice, uh, they're also the best. I think, especially um, for, you know, Iandin base lists, uh, they're definitely worth taking. And to be honest with you, um, they're more useful than just a compulsory troops choice um, in, the, in this uh, craft world. So um, just a quick creator's note. Um, I, I want to go over a list with you guys that I kind of just put together. Now, the thing about this list is I'm only giving it to you guys as an as an example, um, basically just think of it like a framework um, in which to create an effective Iandin list that's also lore friendly. Um, and this list is by no means the optimal list or the most competitive list for the Iandin craft world. Um, it's just not. But it is meant as a general template to give you kind of an idea of how an Iandin army might look like on paper once you put it together. So Again, you can take liberties with this. You can look at that list and say, well, I kind of prefer this instead of this or this instead of this. And you can switch those units out and you can probably make it work. And, you know, in most cases, I know you guys are pretty clever with this stuff. You guys would probably make it even better and more effective. So um, starting out, we're going to be uh, looking at a strike force game of 2000 points uh, with Crawford Iandin. Um, with a battalion detachment, because this is probably the most um, flexible detachment to use in 2K. Um, the Warlord's a part of it, so we start out with uh, 12 command points, which uh, we're going to be using about half of those at the start uh, to give our units, you know, um, relics and Warlord traits and things like that. 
which isn't necessary, but um, I think it's very helpful because um, your your support units are very important for the success of this army. Um, so let's look at our HQ slot. So we have a Warlord of a Farseer Skyrunner. We gave him Fortune and Doom. I like Doom because it basically um, allows us to um, focus down units that might be really difficult to kill. Um, guide is kind of redundant because we have an Autark, which allows units to reroll hits of one. Um, and to be honest with you, in most cases, um, with enhance, uh, we're not going to really need that. Um, we're not going to really need guide too much. So we went ahead and went with doom. Um, the relic that I gave the warlord was the Phoenix gem. It helps him survive, um, a little bit longer just so that he doesn't die and, you know, prevents slay the warlord. And then we have fate's messenger, which gives him added survivability of being able to ignore one damage roll a turn. Uh, we have an Autark Skyrunner with a Laser Lance. Uh, he has the uh, Sunstorm. I spent one command point for Relics of the Eldari. His Warlord trait is Enduring Resolve uh, for another command point. This is essentially your late game objective taker. He is there to support your Wraith units in combat. And then in the late game, capture and steal objectives from enemy units. That is his whole plan. And... Uh, I think the really awesome thing about Autarchs is they also are kind of like mini Farseers. They have an aura which gives you rerolls of ones to hit um, in both melee and shooting as long as you're within range of it. And it, it does affect core units. So that's basically all your Wraith Guard and all your Wraith Lords are going to be rerolling ones to hit while within six of this guy. Um, so very effective um, HQ choice. And then lastly, we have the Spirits here with Ghostwalk. And this guy's whole job is to make sure that your squad of Wraith Blades, which we'll talk about later, that's coming in from Reserve from Webway Strike, is able to charge the turn it comes in. Giving them Ghost Walk, making sure you have that Strands of Fate uh, charge roll of a, uh, um, you know, so you can get uh, a six on their charge distance. Uh, plus the Ghost Walk basically guarantees a charge when they come in on turn two. He has the Cytronome of Iandin to give that unit extra attacks. So that whatever unit they hit, they're going to be able to kill. Um, and he also has Seer of the Shifting Vector to make up some of the you know, command points throughout the game. Um, basically, again, Seer of the Shifting Vector. Every time your opponent spends, or you, spend a command point, you roll a dice on a six, you gain a command point. So it's essentially a command point every turn. Um, as long as you and your opponent are using um, command points, you should have no problem gaining this every turn. And so moving on to troops, um, for troops, we have three units of Rangers. So this is pretty standard for most competitive Elder lists, but Rangers and Iandin are exceptionally good because they're tougher than normal um, and they help Wraith Guard and Wraith Lords kind of do their own thing and they don't have to worry so much about uh, defending objectives so much um, and scoring on secondary objectives. If you leave this to the Rangers, they can get you a lot of points and they're also pretty tough while doing it. And especially with the Gloomfield. Now, I think the Gloomfield is underrated, but I think it works well on Iandin because they're already really tough. Um, you know, because of their Crawford trait, uh, the fact that Rangers are good when they're in cover, they're tougher in cover. Um, and the fact that, you know, Gloomfield makes them even harder to hit outside of 18 inches um, just makes them a very viable choice for holding down objectives um, in the backfield. As for our lead category, uh, we start out with a unit of seven Wraith Blades. Now, these guys cannot fit in a Wave Serpent, so what you have to do with them is you have to use the Webway Strike Stratagem. So we're going to use the Webway Strike Stratagem with them, bring them in reserve. Now, the problem with um, the full unit of 10, even though it's a tempting choice because it's a, it's a nice, thick Death Star, um, the problem with it is that they're extremely inefficient in big numbers, especially since most of them believe it or not, will actually have a hard time getting their attacks in. Yes, you heard me correctly. Because they have a bigger base size, and because typically when they charge in, you can't, you know, always get every single guy within an inch of, you know, an allied model who's also in engagement range, sometimes this is not possible um, against certain, you know, smaller units. So in general, you can't get all your attacks in with a full unit, and... 
Um, to be honest as well, it's overkill. Um, you know, unless you are able to charge into two thick full units of uh, Marines or a really high priority target, like a thick big unit of Terminators, um, to be honest with you, 10 Wraith Blades is just unnecessary. It's not needed. Seven is, is honestly more than enough. Um, and it saves you points elsewhere. So we have seven Wraith Blades. We also have five Warlocks. And they have Protect, Jinx, and Enhance, uh, Drain. So um, at just 100 points, these are very excellent. Now we're going to give them the Seer Council Stratagem for one command point. Um, they count as a free slot, so they don't take up a slot, um, which is useful in, in case you you know want to put more Wraith card units in there or whatever um, in your own lists. Uh, but um, basically these guys uh, protect and make Wraith card tougher. They can reduce enemy armor if needed. Um, and they can also kind of reduce the enemy's ability to fight in combat so or increase your own. It really depends what you want. They're really flexible, but essentially they can cast two powers a turn they come in. Um, in this particular list, I put them in a Falcon using Cloud Strike so they can come in whenever your Wraith Blades come in. And so they can either buff your Wraith Blades or debuff the enemy depending on uh, what's best at the time. And then we have two Wraith Lords, uh, both with Scatter Lasers, Flamers, and Ghost Glaives. And all these guys do is they support the Wraith Guard and Wraith Blade units. Um, they make sure that those units don't get bogged down in combat or don't come across anything that they're unable to deal with. A very tough vehicle, for example, will, um, you know, Wraith Blades are good, but they can't really chew through heavy vehicles that well. So a Wraith Lord is a great support unit for this. Also, they can't really chew through... Um, uh, hordes of infantry that are thrown at them. So Wraith Blades do very poorly against things like Hormagons, um, Gargoyles, things of this nature that can just be thrown cheaply into combat to tie your unit up so that um, you know more expensive and valuable targets uh, can basically escape the wrath of your Wraith Blades. Um, Wraith Lords help deal with this issue and clear out the chaff so that your Wraith Blades can actually hit the targets they want to hit. And then... Lastly, we have two units of five Wraith Guard with Wraith Cannons uh, to kill that heavy stuff that, you know, um, your other units might have trouble dealing with. Uh, things like Carnifexes, um, you know, Hive Tyrants, you know, big Terranid Bugs, um, Lehman Rust Battle Tanks, um, things of that nature that, you know, your Wraith Blades might have trouble dealing with in combat and your Wraith Lords will probably get outmatched by. Um, so... We have two units of Wraith Guard to kind of solve those issues. So this is a big stacked elite category. It has a lot of Wraith units in it. It has support in the form of Warlocks and Wraith Lords. Um, and it has weapons and tools to deal with almost every kind of enemy that you might come across um, in the game. Now, the problem with this, though, of course, and I'll talk about this in the weaknesses later, but the weaknesses of this is all of these units here are extremely vulnerable to things like poison, auto wound abilities, um, extremely high AP weapons that can get around their uh, craft world trait, um, things like that. So you do have to be aware of this. Um, you know, these units are very good against a wide array of enemy targets, but by the same token, they have a problem with certain things. So they have a problem fighting really highly mobile units, units with poison, things of that nature. Um, so to help combat this, we've actually taken some transports, um, basically to protect uh, the units inside from things like poison for the first couple turns, high AP weaponry that you know might otherwise just kill them before they can get into combat or be able to shoot. So we have the Falcon with a pulse laser and scatter laser, just the basic to keep it cheap. Um, we put this, uh, we put the warlocks in this, so they they can basically come down and support wraith guard units uh, when. They come from reserve. We also have two wave serpents carrying the wraith guard to protect them from any da unwanted damage in the first couple turns of the game. We just basically arm them with twin shrinking cannons uh, for the cheapest kind of option to keep them cheap as well. Um, remember, we don't want these guys to do any real damage, and they're probably not going to do any real damage. So the best thing to do with wave serpents is keep them cheap, keep them affordable, so they protect the units that are inside, and that's basically uh, their main job. 
So um, in conclusion, I do think Iandin is a really great craft world. I think it has a lot of synergy with Wraith units. Uh, but the problem with Iandin, I think, is that it's slow. It definitely needs to utilize transports and a lot of buffs to keep it going. Now, if you are successful with this, though, it can really make life extremely difficult for enemy armies. And in fact, a lot of armies won't be able to deal with this. Um, it just really depends on your opponent's um, army's ability to get around the various buffs and debuffs that you're going to be throwing out every turn. If your enemy has ways of dealing with your buffs and getting around them and using either speed or special rules to their advantage to get around your different abilities and stuff like that to score objectives and, you know, etc., then you're probably going to have a hard time. But if the opponent is not able to get through your units and has trouble dealing enough damage fast enough, he's going to be in for a world of hurt. And I've seen it so many times when, you know, players start to get frustrated when unit after unit after unit shoots at the Wraith Blades and they can't do any damage and they know they need to kill them because they're on an objective of theirs. And you can kind of see it in their faces as <laughs> when you're making those saves and then it's like, okay, well, you know, I have Wraith Bone form, I have a four plus invul, I have fortune, etc. And it starts to get really frustrating after a while. So if your opponent is not prepared to deal with a unit like that and he wasn't thinking about a unit like that when he made his list, maybe he doesn't have the tools for it, um, you're going to have a very easy game. Now, on the other hand, if your opponent is playing Dark Eldar or something like that, you're going to have a very, you know, excuse my French, but shit time because Dark Eldar basically hard countered this list. Harlequins hard countered this list. So um, this army... Um, the Iandin craft world with, you know, more Wraith units in it um, is very susceptible to being really hard countered. And, you know, poison, auto wound abilities, mortal wounds, high strength AP weapons, etc. So one of the biggest problems I actually see with these guys now is the new IG, Imperial Guard. Because they auto wound on sixes um, to hit, you're going to be having a lot of trouble against things like, you know, Million Man March um, and armies that have a lot of infantry squads with a high number of plasma guns and last cannons since they're now free. Um, so again, uh, <laughs> you know, army is really susceptible to being hard countered. And you know, in some of those matchups, there's nothing you can really do about it. I've learned this the hard way, and this has always been the case with Iandin. Again, some matchups, you're going to be extremely, extremely strong. You're going to frustrate your enemy to no end. Um, in some other matchups, you're going to be on the receiving end of that. So it's just kind of how you deal with it. And, you know, it's how you deal with those certain matchups. Dark Eldar and Harlequins, you have to play a different game against them. You might have to secede a few objectives in order to keep your army together and compact so that, you know, your opponent doesn't take you apart little by little. Um, and you may have to actually just say, well, I'm not going to go for that objective that game, uh, this game, because I know if I do go for it, I'll spread my forces too thin. And then... I'm just going to get picked apart by poison. So um, it really just depends, right? Um, it depends on the matchup, but typically uh, this army does get hard countered, so be careful about that. However, I do think this uh, can be a very successful list in, in tournaments and stuff, can do very well. I don't know if it can win the tournament, um, but it can certainly, you know, put up a good fight against a lot of the um, enemies out there. And, you know, in, in casual games, it can be really fun to play. And also just very strong once you get the hand, you know, the hang of their uh, slow movement and things like that and the way that their units synergize together and, um, you know, how to utilize your reserves properly and stuff, um, you'll be fine. So thanks for watching, everybody. That's kind of my overview of how to build an Iandin list um, while still remaining lore friendly. Hope you guys have a good one. Um, if you do have any comments or any, you know, tips or tactics that you've used with Iandin, please let me know in the comments below. Peace out, everybody. Have a good one, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks.